Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman and I am a data evangelist with Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the most recent webinar in the Dataversity monthly series, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy with Dr. Wendy Lynch. This series is held the first Thursday of every month. The topic today is Enterprise Enterprise data literacy, myth, or reality. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just a note, Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section of your screen. So find chat in the Q&A panels. You'll find the icons for those sections. Features in the bottom middle of your screen. <laughs> Good job, me reading. As always, we will send a follow up email within two business days containing the links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for our series, Dr. Wendy Lynch. For over 35 years, Wendy has converted complex analytics into business value. At heart, she is a sense maker and a translator, a consultant to numerous Fortune 100 companies. Her current work focuses on the application of big data solutions and human capital management. Through her roles in diverse work settings, including digital startups, century-old insurers, academic medical centers, consulting firms, healthcare providers, and the boardroom, she became familiar with and fascinated by the unique language of each. She also became familiar with the difficult dynamic that often exists between business and analytic teams, preventing them from collaborating effectively. Those experiences led her to her true passion of promoting clear and meaningful conversations conversations that produce mutual understanding and success. The result is her new book, Become an Analytic Translator and an Online Course, which you can see at training.dataversity.net. And with that, I will give the floor to Wendy to start the presentation. Hello, Wendy. Hello, Mark. How are you? Good, good. Okay, good. Yeah, and uh, well done on the intro. <laughs> I always get tripped up on the script somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm happy to have you here. And for those of you who have joined us before, welcome back. We are going to ask the question whether it is realistic to achieve enterprise-wide data literacy. And I'm going to challenge us to see if we can think about if it's possible and maybe even ask whether it is the right thing to do. So let's get rolling. For those of you who uh, follow the area of data literacy, there was a report that just came out from Data Camp. And the state of the uh, literacy area, their conclusions were that 86% of leaders believe that it will be critical for their daily work and their team's daily success to become data literate. And something that is relatively new, 62% said that they believe that AI literacy is going to be important for the success of their team's daily work. It's not a surprise that the same leaders believe that there are risks to their organization for low levels of literacy. Uh, on top of that list is inaccurate decision-making or slow decision-making, decreased productivity, lack of innovation, and other things such as uh, burnout or poor customer experience or uh, inability to keep up with the competition. So we are seeing that businesses know that literacy is a critical area. And we also see reports about the importance and value of literacy. So if you look at reports that come out from uh, management consulting firms, such as the Capgemini Research Institute, they did in a report and uh, some research looking at a variety of different types of industries and corporations. And what they found on their two by two, which was the people and the processes being data oriented and the technology and tools supporting 
use of data, that uh, about one in six are data masters, but over 70% were categorized as they called it as data laggards. What they believe in Capgemini is that when an organization achieves mastery in technology and tools, people and processes, that the value is huge. In their belief, in their terms, it is 70% higher revenue per employee. So as you can imagine, leaders of organizations see these kinds of numbers and they pay attention. So it's no surprise that we see calls for organizations to become more data literate. And the way that I will think about it today is that if literacy is something that we want to achieve, it would be something we want to achieve across a population and a proficiency as high as possible. And when you talk to folks who are in charge of literacy efforts, they believe that that includes uh, reading and recognizing data, understanding exactly what those data tell us. Something that often gets touted is the ability to argue with or convince other people with data. So be able to use it in a function that helps uh, change somebody's mind to be able to explain complex analytics. And then at the highest level, that proficiency might include actually doing the analysis and teaching others how to argue with data, understand data and explain complex analytics. So if we think about it from this standpoint, according to Harvard Business Review article, they believe 90% of leaders in their surveys believe that literacy is going to be critical to corporate success. So this is a, a big deal. And headlines across different periodicals keep telling us that it needs to be a high level of proficiency. There are claims that we can all be data brilliant claims that data literacy will be the second language of business. There's also calls not just to have individuals understand how data fits into their role, but calls to have every employee have a grasp of statistics and know how to interpret charts and analytics accurate. Now, the other thing that happens when we talk about literacy is there is a tendency for those of us who are literate to point fingers at the ones who are not. And so I often see the fingers pointed at certain areas. So for example, there was a review that said the least literate teams were human resources and sales. And I want you to keep that particular comment in mind as we go ahead um, through this conversation today. So if we're thinking that we all have to be very proficient, let's talk about where we are starting. So leaders, when they are interviewed, believe, and this, this was a pretty significant finding, that 75% of business leaders believe that most or all of their workers are already data literate. Now, if you ask middle managers, only 50% of middle managers believe that most or all of the workers in their workforce are data literate. But this is an assumption of a pretty high um, proficiency level. So between 50 and 75% of people being data literate already. But if instead you actually are measuring literacy in the population and thinking about it from this standpoint of layers of proficiency, actually literacy is somewhat low. In one Set of surveys by Click, they found that 32% of executives, and that's the C-suite, 
the CEO, the CFO, the COO, only 32% of them were data literate. When they ask individual workers, about 25% said they were confident that they had reasonable data skills. And then again, in Harvard Business Review, some of the articles that they reviewed said it's really more like eight to 10%. So we have this pretty significant gap in perception and reality. So even if we don't know whether it's 75% that leaders believe or 50% that leaders believe, and we don't know whether it's 8% who are highly skilled or 20% who are highly skilled, there is a gap. And this most recent report from DataCamp indicated that leaders do know that there is a gap. In their report, 57% of leaders believe there is a skills gap that they need to fill in terms of data literacy, and even more believe there is a gap that they need to fill in terms of AI literacy. But then if you look at what portion of organizations are actually doing the kind of training that would be required to get people to a level of proficiency, only 35% of those surveyed in this report do company-wide training, 12% don't do any training, the remainder do a little hodgepodge of different groups. In AI, it's uh, smaller, 25% are trying to do some kind of company-wide uh, intervention and only 20% uh, and a fully 20% aren't doing any training at all. So we have these mixed results. We have this aspiration that all of us should be very, very competent. We have a belief that maybe more people are already literate than really are. And then we have recognized gaps and inconsistent efforts to fill in those gaps. So let's also ask, what is it reasonable to expect? And I wanna point out a few reasons why I think that there are some limits to the number of people who can become or will become highly data literate. And when I say the portion, I mean, if, if everybody from left to right is supposed to be quite proficient from bottom to top, then we have to take a look at where capabilities and interests are. So 64% of US adults operate at a very base math level. And when I say that, I'm not always sure that people know what I mean. So let's look at an international firm that looks at all developed countries and tries to see where people rank in their um, verbal literacy, but also their numerical literacy. And when I say 64% are operate at a basic level, what I mean is 10% can count and add and subtract, and that's it. 20% can understand simple percentages and understand how to count and sort and do basic math. Another 34% can get to simple calculations, simple graphs and tables. And when we think about it from this standpoint, I know that data literacy isn't the same as math, but numbers are constitute a good portion of the data that we work with. And when people hear data, they think numbers more than they think necessarily text. So let's say what else this means. I just showed you levels zero, one, and two on a scale of five. Level four or five asks this question. Looking at this stacked bar chart, can you identify the percentage of men in 1970 who had six or more years 
of school. So can you interpret a stacked bar that has that information? And so what portion of people can identify which part of which bar they should be looking at? And the answer is 9% of US adults can read that graph accurately. So if we're talking about the ability to get every person to a high level of data literacy, we have to realize where we are starting. And I'm not saying that everyone in your company is operating at a two or a three, but I'm saying that where we start from is an important factor we should think about. When we think about fractions, that is another thing that a lot of Americans don't understand. Seriously, it's not eight out of five, but one in three cannot understand a fraction. And on top of that, there are things besides aptitude. There are attitudes and concerns. Um, I thought this was a funny headline. It makes you worry about the particular uh, person who wrote the headline, four in 10 being a majority of Americans who hate math. Again, I am I know I'm conflating math and data, but I think that is how the general public, the general population of workers may perceive it. So in addition to necessarily not, not liking to work with data, 93% of Americans have some form of math anxiety. And if you drill into that, one in five have such severe math anxiety that when they put them in a functional MRI machine, the brain activity registers as pain or fear. That's the level of fear when they think they're going to have to perform a algebra problem or think about doing math. So if we are thinking that 90% of people have a dislike or a fear, it's not just whether or not we have people who are unfamiliar with data and unskilled with data, it's also that they have a major dislike and a fear. So we have a lot of things that we need to overcome if we are going to achieve widespread data literacy. We have to be thinking much more broadly about what we need to overcome. It's not just force feeding information. And when I started to look into these things, it reminded me, and I'm, dating myself, but it reminded me in the 80s when companies started to do wellness programs. And when they implemented them, they used really, really thin people to convince everybody that they could lose weight. They used very, very fit people to convince them that they could be very, very uh, active and highly fit cardiovascular machines. And it feels a little bit like we're doing the same thing. Data science is easy because perhaps it's easy for those of us who already like it, use it and do it frequently. So when we think about data literacy and we hear that the solution is to implement mandatory education, whereby everyone needs to understand what data integrity is, what data reliability is, how to manipulate and query data and how to do elementary statistics that may or may not be realistic when we think about the population as a whole. Do I believe it would be great if everybody in the entire country or in the entire organization that I might work with 
if it would be great for them to have very high proficiency in data? Yes, but we have to ask what we can achieve. And so if we are asking people to see themselves in a data literacy effort, will they see themselves as a pro or will they see themselves as a data folk who's worried that they're gonna get it wrong? Worried that they're gonna take a look at a stacked bar chart and not know what they're supposed to be seeing. So that is where I, um, that's where I think about data literacy when people insist that it is completely doable. And I was struck by a report from Forbes last year that said that if we assume that illiteracy is what's making companies fail, then what you end up doing is creating an adversarial kind of relationship between the people who really get it already and the people who are supposed to be using it but don't quite know how. So I'm gonna pivot here and have us think a little bit differently. So I wanna talk about a new concept that's called strategic alignment. And if you work in the business world, you hear this um, relatively frequently and a lot is written in business and management journals about strategic alignment. I'm gonna call it business literacy. And what it means is that people and processes across an organization are aligned to the purpose and goals of the organization itself. So you see articles asking whether or not your employees understand what the overarching goals and strategy really are. Whether you have helped them understand why they do what they do and how it all fits together. And whether you have taken advantage of what strategic alignment produces. So when folks who believe that strategic alignment is the answer for better performance within an organization, they do analysis that says that when all your people are aligned on the strategy that is the core set of strategies for the organization, you grow revenue 58% faster and are 72% more profitable. So as you can imagine, that catches the attention of leaders. So when you ask leaders whether or not they believe that their strategy is clear, Let's think again about this, I'm gonna call again, strategic alignment is like business literacy. And if we're thinking about everyone having business literacy, so all of your people having high strategic alignment and proficiency in the business strategy, it means that they not only are able to do their job well, but they can connect their job to the key performance indicators for their division and the company as a whole, that they can communicate the strategy for not only their group, but for the organization. They can tie their decisions on a day-to-day -day basis and an annual basis to the overarching strategy. And at the highest level, they can actually help create strategies so that all of this is aligned. So when you ask leaders, how much do you think your employees understand the strategy? Well, over half of executives have confidence that most of their employees throughout the organization can explain company strategy. Now, if you say, are you highly confident? Eh, it goes down to about 20% of executives that have high confidence. But once again, the leaders who are up there in the stratosphere making policy, making strategy, they believe that their people 
are uh, a, a able and are proficient in the strategies of their organization. However, and you can see this coming, when we ask employees directly, and this was a survey that had multiple choice answers, multiple choice answers, fewer than 30% could correctly identify their own company's business strategy. When they asked frontline managers, only 13% of them could identify the top three priorities strategically for their organization. And one study by Price Waterhouse Coopers said only 7% of employees could articulate their company's strategy. So if we are thinking that proficiency is really being aligned in your own work with what's needing, needing to happen in the organization as a whole, then we have a long, long way to go. So how is this important for technology? Well, again, you see researchers who are very tuned into strategic alignment and their claim is that the strategic alignment between the business side and the technology side explains 80% of the difference in company performance. Those who are aligned perform way better than those who are misaligned. But then if you ask technology executives, so the data and analytic and um, uh, governance executives about whether they are strategically aligned with the business, the answers are not the same. So in this study across a whole variety of industries, they asked technology executives, is your technology strategy aligned with the overall business strategy? And as you can see, they often say, yes, absolutely. In banking, almost 80% of them said yes. However, when you ask the business executives, they're not so sure. So overall, what you see is that over half of the technology executives think, oh yeah, yeah, our strategy is totally aligned with the overall business. But only a few more than a third of the business executives feel the same way. So when we start to think about competencies, we can't only look at one kind of competency and not another. And by the way, when we talk to business leaders, they often say, you know, strategic alignment is easy. You just have to pay attention. And just like with data literacy, we tend to believe that because we know it, everybody else does too. So I'm gonna to move to one other topic. Oh, sorry, going back one step. How do we increase business literacy? It's going to sound very, very familiar to what we heard before, mandatory education on strategic priorities, consistent messaging to our employees, and making sure that individuals' uh, key performance indicators are aligned with the business's key performance indicators. So once again, it is about training. We want people to become highly aligned by making sure that they learn all of the aspects of the strategic alignment within the organization. So the third concept I wanna talk about is emotional and social awareness. And I know it's gonna come back around. I'm gonna call this people literacy. Why might we talk about this? Well, folks who believe that this is critical tell you that the evidence is quite strong. 
Forbes talks about emotional intelligence and how critical it is for business. There are studies saying that 80% of long-term job success depends on your emotional quotient, not your IQ. They have found that managers who have a high emotional intelligence score have teams that have 20% higher revenue. And HR leaders are saying they're gonna be hiring managers based on their emotional intelligence, not on how smart they are. So if we are focusing on different types of capabilities, this is yet another type of literacy. If we're talking about having everyone have high people literacy, it means that all the people from left to right have emotional and social awareness and abilities. And that means not only that you're aware of your own emotions, but you recognize emotions in other people that you can truly empathize with the situation that other people are in, that you develop social skills so that you can help connect people, that you can interact with folks when there is a negative emotion or there is a tense situation, that you have the skills to do that. And then at the highest level that you can guide others through those difficult situations. These are important types of skills. And those who do investigations in this use a particular type of assessment, the eyes test. If you have never heard of it, this is a test that helps you understand your degree of emotional awareness and empathy. The test consists of 36 sets of eyes. You don't see the rest of their face. You look at the expression of the eyes and then you pick which of the four uh, emotional uh, states and you choose and correctly identify what that person is feeling. Out of 36 sets of eyes, the average score is only 23. And when we look at who does well and who does poorly, just like all the data people point at HR and sales, the folks who are interested in people literacy point their fingers at folks in science and business. So they are the ones, according to folks who believe that emotional intelligence is the most important aspect, they will be pointing at the same people who are pointing back at the folks who have low data literacy. So once again, how many people have high emotional awareness? Well, studies indicate that 36% of people are able to recognize and identify emotions, which means that a large portion of us do not know how to. Also, a full 95% of people will say that they are self-aware, but in tests about self-awareness, only 10 to 15% of people actually are highly self-aware. So why is this so important when we're talking originally about data literacy? Well, there's some really interesting things that have been shown. So 90% of companies are right now or planning very soon to do some sort of digital transformation, meaning they're gonna try and implement a complete shift in how their people ought to handle data or use data. They're trying to bring themselves up to a higher level of utilizing and um, taking advantage of data. But those efforts fail a lot. Almost three quarters of them fail 
And the analysis by Forbes is that the reason why they fail is because of people issues and they aren't implemented in a way that takes advantage of emotional intelligence. So we're back to the beginning again. We're back to if we want to advance data, we can't only look at data literacy. We also have to look at people literacy. And so how do we increase people literacy? Let's go back to the same thing. Mandatory education is what we hear to improve awareness, understand how to read others' emotions, how to respond to them constructively, and also coaching and feedback. So this is a whole nother area, but as we see people literacy, business literacy, data literacy are all connected and Counselors will tell you, yeah, emotions, those are the easy things. Just like the skinny people who tell us that it's really, really easy to lose weight. So what I want you to do right now, uh, I'm not going to be asking for your, um, your answers, but I want you to uh, answer three questions and you're going to give yourself a score. First of all, I want you to rate your own level of data literacy. And that goes from uh, the bottom to I'm allergic to all data and math, to the middle, I'm comfortable explaining what a basic analytic result means, to uh, a five, which would be I perform advanced modeling myself and I'm very comfortable with all aspects of data. So give yourself a score between one and five. Okay, next one. I want you to rate your business literacy. From one, I just do my job. To three, I can give a comprehensive explanation of business strategy for my company. And then five, where I develop corporate strategy and create the metrics to measure and communicate it. So give yourself a score from one to five. And now lastly, give yourself a rating on people literacy from a one where emotions just get in the way and they're messy and I don't really deal with them to a three, I can accurately identify my own feelings and other people's feelings accurately to a five where I teach others how to recognize and handle emotional issues and difficult situations. So I want you to keep track of those three scores. And I want you to take a look at how many things you have that are a three or higher and how many fives you have. If this group is like most groups, very few people have really high expertise in more than one area. So more than half of you will probably say that you have a three or more in multiple areas. People who are successful often have skills in a variety of areas, but very few of you will be fives in multiple areas. And as an example, just from real world, there are 36% of the population who have a bachelor's degree, 10% who have a master's degree, 3% who have a doctoral degree, and only 9% have a double major, two, two equivalent of two bachelors, 1% have two masters, and less than 0.15% um, have two PhDs we tend to have expertise in one area. We tend to have knowledge in multiple areas. 
So if we're thinking about how do we how do we help people become literate? I think we have to think about literacy in this broader way. So the reality is we want high data literacy, so proficiency across everyone. We want high people literacy, proficiency across everyone. We want high business literacy, high proficiency across everyone. What we have is we have conservatively fewer than a third with high data literacy, fewer than a third with high people literacy, and fewer than a third with high business literacy. So if this is how we are thinking about the world, we have to acknowledge that every single area the people who are experts in data literacy and say it's easy, the people who are experts in people literacy and say it's easy, the people who say, um, who emphasize business literacy and say that it's easy. The data literacy people are saying we need mandatory enterprise wide training. The people who emphasize people literacy, what do they say? Mandatory enterprise wide training. Business literacy, what do we say? Mandatory enterprise-wide training. Is this realistic? Are we really interested in everyone being highly proficient in everything? I'm not sure that that's the case. Especially since the people who are training in data literacy are usually in completely different parts of the organization than the people who are training business literacy or the people who are training people literacy. They're owned by different groups, emphasized by different groups, and implemented by different groups. So I would rather think about people in a slightly different way. The way I would like to think about people is that they each have different strengths. If we think about data literacy, people literacy, business literacy, and think about the proficiency that people have, every person is going to have a different strength, just like each of you had different um, scores of threes or fours or fives across the different areas. So Mr. Yellow Hair here might have really high people proficiency, but not much in data. We might have someone with high data and pretty good people, but every single person is going to have a different combination of proficiency and skills. And if we think about this from the standpoint of weaknesses, so if we're looking at Mr. Yellowhair here, even if he has high people literacy, if we're thinking about weaknesses, we're gonna say, man, he needs to go to boot camp for data literacy. So does he, so does he. But the folks who believe that people literacy is most important are gonna say, well, this guy and this gal, they're the ones that need remedial training because they obviously aren't doing well. If we're focusing on weaknesses, same here. If these two really are not strategically aligned then and we identify them according to their weaknesses, they are gonna need remedial help. So it feels as though some of these literacy efforts are really focused on the weaknesses people have rather than the strengths people have. So let's take these two individuals, one who is very, very highly proficient at data, one who is very, very highly proficient at business, but neither one of them are quite um, proficient at either of the other two. What if we pair them with somebody who is reasonably good at all three. 
What if we pair them and we acknowledge that the person on the left is an analytics expert. The person on the right is a business expert. But rather than insisting that they become proficient in the other two, we ask the person who knows about a great deal about all of it, but isn't an expert to do some translation and work with the other two. What if somebody has strong interests? Like maybe I am not a data expert, but I like math and I would love to learn how to code. I would love to learn some more things. Then maybe again, we have them work together. So let's say a data expert who loves teaching and a business and people expert who love collaboration. And we team them together to create pathways so that someone who wants to learn new skills can add additional proficiency in the way that they deal with data. So again, it's not going from a standpoint of weakness, it's going from a standpoint of existing strength and interest to try and create a different sort of a professional. So if we leverage the strengths people have, the interests they have, and their aptitude, we can start to leverage and create different types of solutions rather than enterprise-wide boot camp in every area that people decide is important. And we value the people for what they do bring. So if we are trying to achieve strategic alignment and have them make aligned decisions, we want that to happen with evidence from data and empathy from people literacy. We may not be able to have every single person do every single aspect of that, but together we probably can. So if we think about data literacy differently, we might say it isn't a separate thing. If we think of it as separate, then we have it isolated rather than putting it into an integrated context so that it makes more sense. If we think that data literacy can make things data-driven by itself, then we might be missing the strategic and social aspects that make data efforts more successful. If we have, if we decide everyone has to be completely literate in every area, that feels like we're creating a hurdle that is just way too high rather than allowing people to make use of their strengths, make use of their interests, and collaborating in ways that they start to trust each other. So are we really needing all the non-experts to become experts or are there combination roles like translators or tech savvy business people or citizen developers who can do more than they do now in areas that make use of the things that they're good at. And we have to think about when we're weakness focused, then, and we are focused on being the, the keepers of what is sufficient, we do create animosity rather than helping people feel good about what they do know and helping them stretch to doing even more. So I would ask you to ask yourselves and your organizations, um, can you put your data literacy efforts in context? Which departments and professions might most want to collaborate? How would a holistic perspective shift how you approach all types of literacy, but especially data literacy? 
And what type of combo roles might be useful, whether it's translators or people who are in operations who can become more tech savvy or people who are in technology who become more people savvy? How do we make the best use of all the skills? So I will tell you that we do have a course for those who think they might wanna be translators. Um, it is hosted at Dataversity. It's based on uh, the book, Become an Analytic Translator. I do think that there are combination skills that aren't just that one that would be amazing for people to explore. And the way we teach the course is we um, role play in different categories, whether you are the business person or the nerdy person or the people person, we get a chance to really look at all of the different roles. So I will pause there and see whether there are uh, any questions before we wrap up. Before we dive into the Q&A, there's a couple of points where I'm glad I've got my mic on mute because uh, I, I laughed out loud at I loved your uh, your role player names of uh, leaders <laughs> and, and analyzer. Yes, <laughs> or, yeah, yeah, that's great. And poor poor Anna is uh, struggles a lot, and uh, Lee doesn't want to admit that she doesn't know very much about data. So yeah, <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, we do have uh, uh, one of our most commonly asked questions in Q&A. Will we get a copy of the presentation after this? You betcha. We'll have a, a copy sent out within a couple of business days. Um, so the slides and the recording. Um, and uh, are the stats, so we had a, early on in the presentation, there were a number of stats that we had presented. Is that uh, across all industries or are there meaningful differences in in data literacy and, 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 uh, and stats across, uh, depending on different industries? There are absolutely differences. And uh, it does make me wonder sometimes when, when, the folks who are touting data literacy point to an organization that has data mastery, for example, the, the one from Capgemini, you have to figure that many of the companies who are the most tech savvy and data savvy are data companies. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it may be a little biased because uh, you can also make a whole lot more money um, in data in many cases than you can, let's say, in retail or grocery or something like that. So there are a lot of differences. And I do understand that sometimes I glaze over um, to give the examples, but yes, absolutely. There are certain ones and um, there will be a lot of finger pointing that uh, if you're talking about social sciences or uh, areas where people, uh, it's very people oriented, they will be less data savvy. Um, but those who are more people oriented um, will point fingers elsewhere to say that others are not um, people savvy. So yep. we've got uh, Elizabeth in chat uh, posted something that I, I kind of like how she worded it. So enterprise wide data literacy is, is like an edict of many data governance programs. I've been there, done that as well. Mm -hmm. How do we help leadership come around to this more realistic perspective that you present, Wendy? Um, without looking like we're shirking responsibility. Yeah. Um, usually when I'm talking to someone, I will do a, essentially make the same sorts of arguments that I made today. Mm -hmm. And so what you might be able to do is instead of saying, we're shirking responsibility and we're not gonna teach this anymore. We say, we believe that there are interests, existing skills, competencies, aptitudes, um, and interests across everyone that varies. And so what we're proposing is we have a, an accelerated bootcamp for those people whose positions really require it and they have an interest and aptitude, then we also have a, you know, a medium level where we are helping those who interact with data and uh, are interested and need to understand things a little bit more. 
And then we are going to train another set of people whose job it is to be an interpreter for those who don't understand it as much. And I, I think that there may be a lot of leaders who actually feel okay about this because I know a lot of CEOs who really are not data oriented and it might feel a little less scary to them too if you introduce uh, levels of training that are um, tailored to their jobs, abilities, aptitudes, interests. Wonderful. Um, if we take the approach mentioned, how do we go about identifying which skill and level data literacy, business literacy, people literacy, each person has in the organization? That's a good question. Um, I think you could use something as simple as the three scales that I gave you um, and or come up with something a little bit less dramatic. And um, yeah, it depends on whether you really feel like you have to do that, um, whether you feel like you need to have those measurements, whether it's okay for people to self-identify. Um, so I'm not, I, you know, it's a good question. Uh, that one is a really good question. I feel like that could almost fun. be the topic of a whole webinar. <laughs> I know, exactly, exactly. How do you figure out, you know, who it is? And many times, which is what makes it hard, is people self-select. Like if you have no people literacy, you don't go into areas that require you to interact with people in difficult situations. Sure. Same thing is you don't, if you don't have high data literacy, you don't go expose yourself to those uh, situations. So in some ways we may need to just presume that you have people uh, who are less inclined depending on what position they're in and look for those people who would be interested first in expanding into one of the other areas so that you can start to make those hybrid um, positions work. But it's funny like how you how you phrase that because chat was talking earlier about um uh, uh people skills and people like as they're they're moving up the corporate ladder and and the kinds of training that they need to be more effective leaders and managers yes. um, was a was a topic of conversation while you were talking about that and during your presentation um we do have one last question here can can this method uh uh can can this method uh, be created in in whatever domain? Like, can can that person be an expert in any domain, or is it um, more around keeping the the wheels of the organization going? Um, I'm going to interpret that question because I'm not sure I'm following exactly, mm -hmm. but I I do think that expertise. Um, makes things, uh, expertise is as much of a downfall as it is a, a benefit. And when I train people in communication, I point out to them that their expertise will likely get in the way. So um, when you are an expert, you think you've seen it all before or you've answered that question so many times that you stop listening to where the person's coming from, or you haven't thought about the basics for so long <laughs> that you've forgotten how to explain it. So expertise is a benefit to an organization, but it can also create divides. And the reason for this webinar is to help people understand how it can divide us when we believe that one type of expertise is the most important. And we don't tend to value the people in the middle who are good at everything, but not great at anything. Instead, exactly. we, we love the ones at the top who are the best. So that's what this is about is let, let's see if we can find these hybrid valuable things like translators and, and other things. 
Well, on that wonderful answer, I think uh, that's all we have time for for today. So thank you very much, Wendy, and thank you very much, everybody, being so engaged in chat uh, for this wonderful presentation and engagement. And uh, we hope to see you next time. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Great. Thank you.